Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation to this lovely country, which uh, is still lovely in spite of the four crises you mentioned, three of which I regret. Um, so uh, here, okay. So let me tell you a bit about um, something. Okay. So. Uh, the idea is that we want to study liquids and eventually glasses. And, um, and we are in a situation like in nuclear physics, in granular matter, in strongly coupled QCD. And, uh, very, very often, you have uh, in solid state strongly correlated electrons. Y you don't have a small parameter. So uh, the things you were taught uh, uh, at the university where you had a simple solution and then you perturb, like QED, like many, th these are, are doomed from the, from the beginning. Not only because the numerical result you're going to get is not very good, but more importantly because you're going to miss the important part of the phenomena. So what do you do in such situations? In such situations you do whatever you can, which is not much, and one strategy that has been uh, used in, in, in many fields, many different fields, is to promote your system to D dimensions and then attempt a solution and then you find that D going to infinity is easy. Um, and, so, and then eventually you want to perturb in 1 over D. Nice example is the helium atom, for example, that you cannot solve exactly because it has two electrons that interact. And um, if you, it's very easy to write a, hel a quantum helium atom in, in d dimensions. It, it's, it's, it's as easy as in any in three. And then uh, the infinite dimensional solution gives you a very, very good approximation for the ground state, for example. And it's easy to do in one line. So, so so this, this has been used in many things, and it, 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 we, we want to um, apply it to liquids. The, thing, the subject has a long story, a long history, uh, but uh, it was only done in the 80s by Frisch and collaborators in, uh, for, for liquids, so in the, in, the, in the liquid phase, and um, only for the thermodynamics and not for the dynamics. So what I'm going to do is mainly dynamic. So let me just okay, keep this in mind, and now I go to a, a different thing. In the 80s, uh, these gentlemen uh, proposed, had this wild idea that if you considered models which are like spin glasses, these are plus minus one spins, for example, and these are random Gaussian interactions with signs plus minus ones. So 
that they, they had this wild idea that this kind of model with p larger than 2, if p is 2, this is a, a spin glass. If p is larger than 2, it was a curiosity, studied uh, a lot mainly in Europe, uh, but mainly for formal reasons. Um, but these guys had the idea that the intuition that if p was larger than 2, so for example, three spin interactions, this was going to be a good model for not spin glasses, but structural glasses. Uh, glasses uh, like this. So, uh, how did they get to such a wild uh, uh, guess? Is 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 is, a, is, a, is an interesting story in itself. Of course, ah, and once you propose this, you solve this model, which is easier than a system of particles, and you get a list. Of, this is more for specialists, but there are these uh, kind of transitions and aging and shear thinning, this is the phenomenology of glass, were explained, explained between quotation marks, by this model. Of course, once you'd said this, and, and you find glass transitions and so on. Of course, there was immediate criticism because of various things. First of all, the J's uh, were random. And, of course, a normal glass has no uh, explicit randomness inside. It's just particles do it whatever they can do. Classical uh, criticism was, well, but I don't see any particles in, in this kind of models. Uh, where are the particles? Of course, there are no particles. I told you there were spins that are artificial. Also, that this is a never correct approximation. It's, it's a kind of thing you're proposing as a metaphor, but you have not, no limit in which this really becomes uh, what you are doing. And there is a se most serious criticism was that it neglects activated processes, and I'm sorry I cannot explain to you what they are, because I don't know what they are, in fact. Uh, it, it usually means everything that is not included in the theory you are considering. Um, so, okay. So, quickly it became clear that uh, this uh, assuming randomness wasn't necessary. You could do without randomness and still have models equally artificial but without randomness. Okay. So, the idea here is do, do we believe that if we take particles, spherical particles, and make a liquid of these particles in d dimensions with d large? This might give us a justification of this kind of um, proposal. So we, instead of doing this, we, we follow a completely different strategy. We try to um, work in large dimensions and see what we get. If we get a similar scenario, this doesn't prove anything necessarily. It's not because it's we get the same things in d infinity that d equals 3 we have solved it, but at least we have something where we know what kind of approximation we are making, we can control it, and the most important thing is that now we are going to study a liquid in d infinity dimensions, but we know how to simulate a liquid in 12, 11, up to 2 dimensions. So, this means that if we have things in infinity, we can see whether between, okay, whether 12 behaves like what we found numerically, behaves like what we found in infinity, and then what is going, how does this corrupt into three dimensions? This is, this is I think, crucial. Okay, and what happened is that, yes, you get a thermodynamic transition, you, you get a second transition which was unexpected. I'm not going to talk too much. This is large dimensions. This transition was unexpected. It was forced upon us by the large dimensional limit. And the question is, is there a dynamic transition just as there is in uh, the system of P-spin uh, that had been proposed? There is, and I'm going to show you how you derive. So what I'm going to concentrate now is in large dimensions, how do I do dynamics? How do I study the dynamics of liquid system in D going to infinity dimensions? You don't need the details, but the, the aim of all this is to see whether this uh, large D thing in dynamics also is giving us something that resembles the theory I described before, the metaphor I described before, which is called, in the, for the dynamics, is the mode coupling theory. So the mode coupling theory is the version of this 
this idea for dynamics, for dynamics in the liquid phase. Okay, so now we're going to do dynamics for large D and see whether we get the same. This has been a very, very long-standing problem whether mode coupling theory was the limit, exact in the limit of large dimensions. As you will see, the answer is no and yes. Okay, so large dimensions. What is, what is it that you have to understand about large dimensions? And it's the only thing, if you're going to take home one message, it's only this picture, is the following. Imagine you have three balls that are touching in any dimension. So now, how many ways can I, different ways can this happen? Well, keep these two fixed, then we have a global factor, it's not important. The third one can be anywhere like this, touching. This is what I tried to do with this picture. Now, how many ways can I do three balls touching? Uh, sorry, three balls, only two and two touching, so the, the picture you have there. Well, the best you can do is put these two, and then the third one can be anywhere, especially here, which is in the diameter, which is the largest part. Now, you see that there are more ways to keep these three touching than to keep three mutually touching in much m many less ways than in a, in, a, in a line structure. That's okay, but now do the same calculation in infinite, in large D or in any dimension, and you will see immediately that the ratio of these two becomes overwhelming in large dimensions. So in large dimensions, to make three things touch mutually is infinitely l more rare there are many, 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 exponentially many less possibilities than to make them touch two, two by two. So, interactions in large dimensions are tree-like interactions, where particles, you can assume that they are touching, but never making closed loops. So this is the only thing you really have to understand it, why large dimensions simplifies life. Technically, uh, you will see in a minute. So we put n particles in a box. Now the box in the dimensions to make a cubic box is not the best idea. The best idea is to put them on the surface of a sphere of d plus one dimensions and make the sphere large. Uh, the nice thing about this is that then the box doesn't have any walls and the even nicest feature is that translations and rotations when you are on the surface of the sphere are part of the bigger group of rotation, so technically it's, it's nice. And you do the virial expansion. Now, uh, remember how it was. The virial expansion, you artificially created, uh, rewrote the partition function in terms of these things. So you subtract one, and then you add one, and then you write these are the Meyer factors. And you have a diagrammatic, because these factors are only non-zero when you are close, if you have hard spheres. And then touching means that this is going to be non-zero. If they don't touch, this factor is zero. You're here. So you can do an expansion. And now what I said about touching spheres mutually, you can translate it immediately to this virial series. And immediately you conclude that only diagrams that are trees contribute in the large D limit for the reason I said a minute ago. So that's all you need to know. But that was okay, and that was the idea that Frisch and Rivier had 30 years ago. Now the question is, how do you do it for dynamics? Well, you have to invent a dynamic alveolar expansion, which as far as I know, wasn't invented. Something similar was invented, which is a quantum virial expansion, but not a, a dynamic one. But again, what is dynamics? Is a spaghetti in space and time. So now you, you make the discussion for these world lines of the particles. And uh, you can do a kind of Meyer expansion. It's not the end of the world. People had done Meyer expansions for polymers, and, and, and time is a bit like a polymer, no? where, where the index is just the time. So you do that, and when you look at it from above, the discussion I said about touching, you can make it for trajectories. Now the question of touching or not touching is, is a question, matter of trajectories. But you do the expansion, you get the terms that you keep the terms that and always following the same principle and that's it. It's long but it's straightforward. And what do you get? Well in the end what you get is you have a two-point function which gives you how 
a particle moves away from itself in time. You see, it's the displacement squared. And you get a closed equation for this uh, thing. This is, this is the result. For the moment, this is not a result, because I didn't tell you what m is. But I put it in this format. If you want, this is the definition of m. So why do I put it in this way? Because in this way, it's the way that mode coupling is written. Remember that mode coupling is this um, metaphor I told you with p-spin uh, interactions. This is what you get. This was the theory that we are trying to see whether it, it's re reproduced in large dimensions. So it has this form. The peculiarity is that mode coupling, by definition, is when m is a simple function of delta. So if m is, for example, delta squared, this is mode coupling. This is the mode coupling theory for this quantity. Okay? There is time, sorry? Uh, yes, here it could be a second derivative, sorry. Uh, it could be first or second, but here there is a, 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 yes, indeed, there is a time derivative. Yes, 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 yes. And so if m is delta squared, simply delta squared, this is the mode coupling equation for delta. Okay? Um, this was known, etc. So what do we get? Well, we get something that has this form, but m is not a function of delta, but it's a functional of delta. It means that it contains integrals all mixed up of deltas in older times. So, for example, the convolution of delta of t and delta of t at another time, this is not a, a simple function. So, we get something that resembles mode coupling in the fact that m is given simply by something of delta, but that something is not a simple function, it's a complete mixed up functional. Okay? And now I will tell you what is that functional, but I will be very quickly. I will do it very quickly. So to obtain that functional, you have to do an auxiliary calculation where you have a diffusion of a particle in one dimension. One dimension because these kind of problems usually reduce to a one-dimensional problem. And the only thing is that you have a memory term which is given by the m you want to calculate and a noise that is correlated with the m you want to calculate. And then you solve this, but self-consistently you want that m is also the correlation of the force. It doesn't matter. The only thing you have to retain of all this is that there is a procedure where already there is nothing, and the number of particles is gone, this is exact, but you have to put it in the computer, unfortunately, and self-consistently solve. For those of you who have followed uh, interact strongly interacting electrons, this is very, very close to what is called dynamical mean field theory, where you reduce a lattice, a Hubbard model in large dimensions to a one-dimensional, uh, to, to a single electron interacting with a self-consistent interaction. It's, it's typical of mean field. So yes. Uh, no, 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 it's part of the game, the fact that they repel and then they have to touch. So they have to avoid, but they have to come back because if not, this thing is zero. The force, force, correct, because you have no force, is it? So, yeah, and, and this, memory, this memory is part of the game, precisely. It re-enters here, and that memory at the level of this solution is, is, the, is reflecting the memory of the liquid. Uh, so, so it's... Well, you'll see in a minute. Uh, okay, so you solve this. The only thing you have to see is that this is a way of expressing m in terms of delta, but uh, it's a way that is very convoluted. It's not simply delta cubed, as, as is the case of mode coupling. Okay, so what, what does this give you? Well, when you plot in terms of time what delta is, the displacement, at the beginning it's ballistic, which is to be expected if you have inertia. Then you get some slowing down, or what looks like a slowing down. And then, well, we were in a box that is big. This is the size of the box. So this is not physical. You can put it here. It's, you can work with a bigger box. And then as you move to higher densities, this plateau becomes larger and larger and larger. And there is a finite density at which this plateau becomes infinite. What this means is that there is a density at which the particle never goes away from a, a kind of cage created by the other particles. So this is the same phenomenology as mode coupling, but here, really in large dimension, we have proven that something is happening at a finite density, 
What is happening is the glass transition. There is no crystal. You can convince yourself of that, but what you do have is that a particle, because of the presence of the others, never can diffuse completely away. Let me make it uh, clear by now that, from now, that this transition is fake. It exists in infinite dimensions. It doesn't exist in finite dimensions. In 12 dimensions, it is almost a transition. In 10, it is a bit bad, worse of a transition. In three dimensions, you have to show some goodwill to, to see it. But, but there are lots of people who have this goodwill. So, Okay, so what we found is that the solution is and is not of the mode coupling form because the actual numbers of where the transition happens and so on is different from mode coupling. The actual form of the equation, as I told you, it, this ker memory kernel is, is not a function, simple function, it's a complete complicated functional, but the basic phenomenology, these guys, when they proposed this p-spin phenomenology, they were right. Okay, so what we have is that this large dimensional thing confirms this scenario confirms means, yes, it is exact, essentially, in large dimensions. Uh, we can see to what extent it is good at 12 dimensions, and we can discuss that, and simulations are okay. And then from 12 to 3, we see it degrading. At 12, they are okay. There isn't a dimension where something fantastic happens, like in ferromagnets. Here, roughly, you get from infinity to 12, things look similar. Similar, but transitions become crossovers, etc. And then you see it degrading as you go down to three, and it's not an, an ideological matter. You can you can go look at the simulations and say, listen, this is as good and as. Sorry. No, you can go lower than twelve, uh, uh, larger than twelve. You cannot because a little cube is already a lot of particles. But uh, no, twelve almost works perfect. Almost meaning that this transition, which I say is fake, is still fake, but it's a crossover that looks like sharp at 12. As you go down, this thing broadens, and, and well, I mean, it's, it's not an ideological matter. It's just you look at the things and you, you see how good and or how bad they are. Do I have... Sorry? No. That's, th that's probably true, absolutely true. There is no critical dimension. Not for this. No. But it doesn't exist as soon as D. At D99, the transition is not rigorously true. It looks almost like a transition, but probably it's, it's like it's as a, as it disappears as soon as D, D is finished. So let me, I have seven minutes, no? Okay. This, sorry? Five. Okay. Let me take five minutes to tell you what we're trying to do now. One of the many things that people are trying to do now is the one is the following. Okay, so now if one analytically wants to go from D infinity to finite D, what does one do? Well, naively you would say, okay, I do a 1 over D expansion. Uh, I have used D as a large parameter. It is normal to think that 1 over D is an interesting expansion. The problem is that 1 over D is not hard, but it's not interesting because it seems, or at least I am convinced, that everything that is interesting is exponentially small in D. So it's not something you can calculate with a 1 over d expansion. It's, it will be e to the minus d. Let me give you an example. You are packing spheres. So you pack them solidly like this. You will find that some particles can move. Still in a rigid packing, they have the space to move. They are called rattlers because they can rattle, even in a, in a, in a packed packing. Okay. The number of rattlers, you can simulate it in three, four, two, three, four, five dimensions, and you find that it decreases its here exponentially with the, the dimension, okay? It's not something that is particularly interesting, but let me tell you why it can be a bit interesting. So you know that it's a phenomenon that large D doesn't see, because at large D you have no rattlers, because they are exponentially decreasing with the dimensions. So let me see. How, what would be a project to do that sounds reasonable? You can try to calculate the number of rattlers 
in d dimensions and you can calculate the factor in the exponent. So if the number is e to the minus d times something, that something you can calculate. This is exponentially small corrections. And how do you do this? Well, with it's a calculation with large deviations. You add a skin in the potential, then you calculate the new free energy. It, it's something that you can do. So if you have a factor e to the minus a times d, and you are doing a large d thing, you can calculate a with the same techniques. And you are guaranteed by the simulations that if you did this correctly, it seems that it's a good, knowing this, this gradient is accessible to a large decalculation. So this makes you dream that one day one will be able in large d to calculate the expre factor in the large d. For those of you who do semi-classics, you know that you have two kinds of contribution. You have proportional to h bar, which you, or h bar squared, which you don't ever calculate because they're not interesting. And then you, you have e to the minus 1 over h bar. This you are accustomed to, for example, tunneling. And uh, this is accessible to a semi-classical calculation. Although it's h bar small, it is accessible to semi-classical calculations because you do instantons. And this is the, a method whereby you can, even with classical solutions, find things that are exponentially small. I believe that that is the way to go. I don't know how good it will be, but the number of rattlers, which is not in itself particularly interesting, but it could be a test case to show that the principle applies. Finished. First question. <laughs> clap. <laughs> ah, no, sorry, it's me. <laughs> you shouldn't clap. <laughs> When you're completely jammed, yes. Uh, so we are doing it, and because we don't know how to do better, we are at the bottom and packings that you don't normally access. So that's a defect of the calculation we can do. The ideal would be to do it after a crunch, you know, but so it's a dynamical thing. So it's it's not. Uh, that's going to be much harder. So. Whatever we are doing will be okay for the moment in, the, in an assumption that these two, two, two things don't differ a lot. And we have to see. We will have to see. A yes and no. I mean, so uh, for those of you who don't know what the Gardner transition is, the, when you do, you have the dynamic transition, then you have a thermodynamic transition that is lower, and then you have a second transition, which is called the Garner transition, because Elizabeth Garner discovered it for some kind of model. If you want to do dynamics, the problem is that if I do dynamics here, the system never equilibrates. So uh, what you have is aging, and that's not a defect of the theory. This is what glasses do. But for historical reasons, we are accustomed to, want to cal wanting to calculate equilibrium quantities. You could start from an equilibrium configuration and then do dynamics. For this, you need to do dynamics plus replicas, so it's, it's a mess. Um, and in that sense, if you do that, you're going to see a Gardner transition. Now, is it true that out of equilibrium, if I quench the system to this temperature or pressure, do I see something that reminds me of Gardner? I think so but it hasn't been done yet, but I believe so. so. So the answer is yes, out of equilibrium. If you want to do the true Garner equilibrium transition, then you would really have to work, but it's doable. Okay, okay, so wait, jamming and glass, you're already begging for, uh, 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 so. Uh, what happens is the following. There are three transitions, okay? Forget this one, you, 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 you will survive without that, that one. Okay, so this one is, if you calculate the Gibbs partition function, it has a discontinuity only here. Now, 
Imagine you get a system in a high temperature or, or, or low pressure and then you quench it to a, a situation anywhere here. What, what happens? Well, when you're above, no problem, the system equilibrates and the uh, equilibrium thing and the dynamical calculation give you the same results. If I quench here, just anywhere below here, the system never equilibrates. Okay. Or it's aging in the, in the language of classy people. So I don't see any evidence of this at all because the system never, never equilibrates anywhere there. So here you have a dynamic tra uh, static transition and equilibrium transition, which is a little bit irrelevant concerning the dynamics. So, and that's typical of all this. It doesn't actually exist at any finite temperature. It's a crossover at all finite temperatures. Uh, so, so all finite di dimensions. It only exists in infinite dimensions. Yeah. Yes. So what 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 I what I say is, is the following: you, you yes you 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 simulate. If I could simulate the system in dimension ninety nine, I would see that the transition doesn't exist, but I get an extremely sharp sharp crossover. And nothing special happens at twelve or at say six. Map I cannot, but they are similar. Yes. So, so, yes, and this is bizarre. Uh, when you go to D infinity, the thing qualitatively looks very much like one of these disordered models. When I go to finite dimensions, or at least uh, not very high dimensions, the disordered models seem to begin to be quite different from particles. Uh, this happened already at the beginning when this was proposed. Uh, when this proposal was made, people immediately wanted to do this in three dimensions and see what happened. And what happens doesn't resemble anything. So this um, metaphor seems to be between this in mean field, not in finite dimensions, and large D. But then when you go to dimension four, I don't think this resembles particles in four dimensions. So it's sort of the... People really wanted, as you say, people wanted to find that this in three or four dimensions was going to behave like a particle system, like a gas. Uh, it doesn't look like, it doesn't look like. Or at any rate, that is not a good theory for. This was a failure since the beginning, no, of the uh, whole project. It was one of the criticisms that people had with this thing. Okay, so thank you very much for the very kind invitation. I'm, it's really nice to have chalked up another continent on the list of places I've visited, and the Brazil has looks fantastic. I'm really looking forward to seeing more of it. So actually, I'm going to talk about, uh, as Frederick said, I'm going to talk, talk was talking about systems that sort of fell out of equilibrium due to slow dynamics, and I'm going to talk about uh, systems which aren't in equilibrium because they're driven, because they're, they're systems that have currents in their steady states. Um, so the work I'm going to talk about was done in, in collaboration with Vincent Demery, who's at the École de Physique Chimie Industrielle at Paris in France, and Matthias Kruger, who's at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Stuttgart in Germany. So the first part is with Vincent. 
So what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about stochastic density functional theory applied to the conductivity of Brownian electrolytes. I'm going to revisit a theory of Onsager. So I was saying to Jan that when you tell people that you work on electrolytes, that they say, you know, they look at me and they say, well, I mean, I can see you've got gray hair, but I didn't realize you were that old. Um, but, you know, the people who work in the field of electrolytes, we always try and emphasize to people that lots of the problems actually weren't solved. And... Uh, People have sort of s skated around them to a certain extent. And I, so I'm going to talk specifically about electrolytes in the first part. And then I'm going to talk about um, something that I've always liked doing, computing diffusion constants. So I was, uh, I'll, I'll come, come, come back to that. So I'm looking at a system which has Brownian dynamics. So we have basically have a Langevin equation here. So I have a system of particles which are interacting. If I'm going to, I'm going to talk about salts, okay? So you can imagine the, the reds could be the cations and the blues could be the anions. And so basically, each particle has a bare diffusion constant. So the bare diffusion constant is the second term in the equation. So it's di. So i is, 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 the, is the particle type. So, you, you know, you have ions. Ions will have different diffusion constants uh, depending on how hydrated they are, they are what the effective hydrodynamic radii are. Um, and the second term, obviously, these are going to interact by, um, in the case of electrolytes, a Coulomb interaction, which, you know, moderated by the dielectric constant of water, but at the level of approximation, we just have a constant dielectric constant, um, which seems logical. Um, we have white noise. So if I just throw away the first term, so the F is the, the part, so these particles are interacting. So the, the easiest problem is just to look at a system of particles. So the force of interaction is given by the gradient of an interaction potential. And if I have pairwise interactions between particles of type I and J, I'm going to have Vij, Xi minus Xj. So these are interactions which just depend on the distance between the particles, but you can actually uh, do things better than that. So actually, for the first part of the talk, just imagine we've got uh, salt ions, okay? So the pluses, the pluses are repelled away from each other and they're attracted to the blues, and the blues are repelled from each other and attracted to the, uh, attracted to the red. So it's just, it's just salt with Brownian dynamics. Now, in order to study this problem, we're going to look at the dynamics of the density field. So there are sort of lots of different density functional theories, and, uh, but it's important when you look at these problems. Often density functional type theories actually they don't have any noise. They're describing the dynamics of an average density field. So you take some sort of equation, you average over the noise, and you look at how the average density field behaves. Typically, because the system isn't in, a, in, in an equilibrium situation, you're going to look how it relaxes. So basically, we're going to look at this object here. So rho of alpha is the density of particles of type alpha at space x. So basically, we have these delta functions and at the point x. And basically, we're looking to see if one of these particles, i in the ensemble of alpha, say the cations, is at the point x. Okay. Now, the thing is, we can write down what looks like a, a mean field free energy. A mean field free energy would be if Instead of having rho here, I actually had the average value of rho, okay? So this is important. So H is given by, so the H is basically beta times something that looks like the ordinary, the, what you would guess, the mean field free energy. So you have this entropic term. For each particle type, we have a term rho alpha of x, log rho alpha of x. And then we just have the interactions, okay? So these are just the particles alpha and beta interacting with each other. There can be a self-interaction for the Coulomb gas, the mutual repulsion between cations or anions, and if we change the sign of the interaction, we have the attraction. And we can do different valencies as well, okay? So, so this is the... Now, what you can actually show is that the density field itself, so if you start from the microscopic dynamics for the Brownian particles, if you actually plug the dynamics in, you look at what, what, what are the consequences of the individual Langevin dynamics for the density field, what you can actually show is that formally this is the equation it obeys. Okay, so you basically find that, so this is the diffusion constant of the particles of type alpha. And you see you have the mobility constant here, which is actually depends on the density field. That actually basically means if I look at a density field, um, actually when I was interested in this, I never understood model B dynamics because I, well, I, I asked the question, well, how, how can the density field ev evolve if there's no density there, right? So if, if the density is zero, obviously there's no, there can be no ev evolution of the density field. So we have this. So actually, this term is easy. I mean, if you look at the Kawasaki derivation, you know, this is basically the functional derivative of this 
free energy function with respect to rho. This is the chemical potential. So this is, you know, where you say the current is rho grad mu, right? So you're writing down Fick's law. And then basically, I mean, you've, what, what actually turns out, the noise term takes this form here. You can derive this directly. But if you insist that this field obeys detailed balance, okay, you know that this, if I look at this in terms of an operator, if I square this guy up here, it has to be this guy here. Okay, so this gives you detailed balance. And this means that you're getting to the right equilibrium distribution. Okay, and then for each particle type, you have these noise correlators. So this noise here is actually a vector. And I, I should have, I, okay, so it has the components and it also has the particle types. So there's no correlation. The correlation is white in space, white in time, and it's white, discrete white between different particle types and in different spatial components. So you can actually show um, that that's the, that describes the density of your density field. So actually, I'm going to talk about electrolyte conductivity. So I'm going to talk about something that was called the Wien effect. So we're talking about sort of 19, 1920s physics here, because hence the gray hair, right? Um, experimentally observed Wien effect. So basically, you, if you increase, uh, you have an increase in electrical conductivity with increasingly applied electric field. So basically, you have a zero field response. So you can write, say, that the current is sigma times E, but sigma itself depends on E, the electric field and actually the conductivity is bigger. So sigma E is a function which increases. So this, this, was, this is called the first Wien effect, and the first theoretical explanation of this first Wien effect for strong electrolytes, so let me say what strong electrolytes are. Strong electrolytes are, we, we, were, in, we were bathing in a strong electrolyte yesterday, okay? So you have a salt, so when you put NaCl into water, you look that most, you very find very, very few uh, molecules of NaCl, there's complete dissociation, okay? As opposed to something which are called weak electrolytes, where you find a, a bigger majority of um, mo ionic molecules, okay? So this first Wien effect, I mean, it was first analyzed by De Bayer and Huckel in 1923, and they were looking, they were looking at the hydrodynamic uh, calculation rather than a Brownian calculation. And uh, this was one of Onsaga's first contributions. And actually, Onsaga carried on working on this problem for a long time. He was still writing papers in the 1950s. And it's, uh, apparently, he went into Dubai's office as a young man and told Dubai that he was completely wrong. And, uh, so, and Dubai, apparently, was quite nice about it. So, so if I talk about these Wien effects. So basically, when you have ions, plus, plus and minus ions, Obviously, when I apply an electric field, the electric field wants to drag them in different directions. But these are attracted to each other. So actually, an ion feels what you can call the bare effect of the electric field trying to force it. But as I start separating, I mean, even though they're not bound, they tend to be in the vicinity of each other. Like you're more likely to find a plus next to a minus. So as you start driving the system, there's a, an electric field due to the pluses and the minuses that say, well, actually, we'd, we'd quite like to stay together. We don't want to be completely separated, okay? So there's actually a reaction field. So the electric field which is um, experienced by the ions isn't actually the bare electric field. So actually, everybody here who's above a certain age has probably taught something about conductivity. So normally, we look at, you talk about the bare conductivity calculation. Um, the conductivity is basically related to the the, the, the density of charge carriers. Let's have a look at the calculation. Well, why do we have a Q squared, Z squared? So Z is the valency, right? So Q squared, there's a Q squared there because um, it's the electric charge, so I have to multiply my current by Q. But the electric field, the force due to the electric field is proportional to Q as well. So you have a Q squared, and then you have a mobility factor here. Okay, so, so these are the, so this is, this is the bare conductivity. So naively, if you were teaching, uh, I don't know, a first, second year course, this is what you would say would be the conductivity. So that's the first Wien effect. So Onsaga came along with a nice theory. He said he was going to, he was analyzing dilute systems where the, effective, the dominant effect is a two-body one. He also assumes the debye huckle screened interaction because the problem with electrostatics, if you look at the virial expansion for electrostatics, because it's a long-range interaction, uh, there's something slightly pathological about it. The virial expansion is not, it has, non it has fractional powers of the density in it. Okay? So he has to assume the debye huckle screen interaction between the ions, and he calculates the renormalization of the electric field which is seen by the ions. So, so this is, you know, this is one of the first out of equilibrium computations, you know, when people talk about, I mean, Onsager obviously made a huge contribution to out of equilibrium statistical mechanics, 
But he, you know, at this time, this was his first contribution. And he, when he was doing this, there were no Kubo formula for, cal for calculating the small field uh, interaction. There's another effect, which is the second Wien effect, which is also which is weak electrolytes, where a large fraction are, are, are bound in germ pairs. So you have an equilibrium which exists between ions which are in molecular, we have molecular bonds, and they joined up with each other, and the free ions. And the second Wien effect is slightly different because basically what happens in the second Wien effect, um, you actually increase the density of free charge carriers. The effect of the electric field is to shift the chemical equilibrium, the, the reaction constants between bound salt molecules and free ones. So that's a slightly different effect. I mean, when you talk to tell people about this, I mean, you should be able to have a theory where, you know, you put these two effects together, but this is very difficult. And the way in which these Berger-Gerum pairs form and how everything works is, is a really quite an outstanding problem. People, I mean, people like Jan have worked about this, and uh, there are lots of sophisticated theories, and you know, the, the field theorists have theories which are very nice but don't work. And <laughs> so, so, in, so in principle, these two effects somehow should be the same so if you could get over this uh, distinction between very close molecules and actual bound uh, pairs. So let me have a look at this stochastic DFT approach. So basically, we're going to have an interaction potential. So, I so the first term is this is the Green's function. So the first term here, we're just having the Coulomb interaction. Z alpha, Z beta is just the, the valency. Okay. So for an ordinary salt, the plus Z alpha would be say one or minus one, depending if you're looking at positively charged or negatively charged ions. Now you can put other interactions in here. Nothing, and I'll talk about other interactions here. So you have, so what goes into the theory, you have a list of uh, electrostatic interactions which are equilibrium interactions, e equilibrium properties, right? The, the Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution only depends on these guys. And we have a dynamical aspect here, which is the diffusion constant, which is related to ion ionic mobility by the Stokes-Einstein relation. So if I look at stochastic density functional theory, if I look at the current in the theory that I showed down, so I've used, used slightly different notation. This is the diffusion constant. The current is given by this. Okay, so this F alpha are the forces, all the forces acting on the particles alpha, and this is the noise. Now this force, importantly, this is the bare term. If you were just doing the simple theory, this is just the dragging due to the uh, electric field, but this is, the, this is due to the interactions. Okay, so this is the force due to all the interactions between the particles, and we have the same white noise. Okay, so let's. So this actually works very nicely. So if I'm looking at the conductivity, all I have to do is, you know, it's just sigma e times e. This is the definition, and it's just equal to the at some point in space the sum over alpha of q alpha, which is the charge. This is how I'm conducting. This is an electric current, and j alpha a particle current. So if I want an electric current, I have to multiply it by the charges. So if I do this computation, I find this is the bare calculation which we teach. And this is the modification due to interactions. And as you can see, um, it depends on, there are two terms in the density here. This is the term that depends on the interactions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to linearize my stochastic density, density functional theory. I'm going to look at the density fluctuations about the average mean value of the density, OK? And I'm going to look at the correlation function of these density fluctuations. Um, so I can, I can write down a linearized equation, okay? And um, so it takes this form here. And because I've got two species, I, can, I have a couple differential equation between the, so these are the fluctuations of the positive charges, fluctuations of the negative charges. And I get a, I get a Gaussian field theory with this dynamics, okay? Um, and so the dynamics, it has two components to it. So this A of K is basically a, this is related to the Hamiltonian for the, the, the Gaussian fluctuations. And this R is the dynamical operator, which appears in the noise and in the deterministic part of the... It's the, it's the so it, it occurs here or here. It's just a detailed balance of the dynamics. You can work out the correlation function, and you can work out what this A is. This is, this, this is, the, this is the debye huckel theory. Okay, this is the, de, the quadratic debye huckel theory. And actually, you could, there are lots of different ways of looking at it, but you can look at the... Uh, this these objects, the correlation function which you need to compute, this is the term, the modification of the conductivity. Uh, this C that you need to compute, it's easy to you know, find that it obeys this equation here. And normally, um, the equilibrium correlation function is A was the fluctuation, it, it was the 
the, the free energy matrix, the Gaussian fluctuation matrix. So normally the solution to this equation is um, C is equal to A to the minus 1, yeah? The correlation function, if your Hamiltonian has a matrix A, it's A to the minus 1. If you see, so you see if I say that A star is equal to A, then I, uh, there's a factor of temperature as well. C is T times A to the minus 1, so this is the solution. But it's not quite, it's, it doesn't work here because I have this drift term and A star, it's the complex conjugate, is not equal to A. So you can actually do the calculation. You can work out what this looks like. So you get a very, very formal, a very general expression for any sort of interacting particle system. So the key quantities, what do you find here? You find something which I'm going to call M squared. So M, M plus and minus squared are basically the components of the Debye mass the inverse screening length coming from each species. So you find these guys here. So the this is the total Debye mass squared. And you also find dynamical quantities, okay? So we have purely, so we have M prime squared, which is like a weighted Debye mass with the diffusion constants of the conductivities, okay? And that's related to the bare diffusion constant, sigma zero, the diffusion constant you would naively have if there were no interactions. So actually, so what you can do is you can look at the zero field conductivity and you get Onsaga's results very, very quickly, okay? So you can recover the whole of the Onsaga theory, which you could have got by looking at fluctuation, dissipation, and linear response. You get nice effects. For instance, you find that the, the modification of the diffusion of, 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 of the conductivity goes like the square root of rho, so it has this non-analytical behavior, right? But you, you get this without assuming the screening. It comes out of the theory. Okay, and the thing is, and you can do the full outer equilibrium calculation as well. So if you have, this is the dimensionless electric field, it's a so this is a static quantity. So you actually get, you know, so this is the calculation that Onsaga and Kim did in 1957. So you get very, very simple, basically you can get the whole of the Onsaga opus on uh, conductivity just from this stochastic density functional theory. And the other thing is, it's nice, you can look at correlation functions as well, okay? So if we look at, uh, so the first thing is the pair correlation function H plus H plus X. So this is the probability that you have another cation near a cation. So I place a positive charge in the middle. You can see that there's, there's this symmetric hole which is dug out, right? The cations don't want to come and sit next to another cation. Um, if you apply an electric field, you can see that this, this, pr this probability related to a probability is, is deformed, okay? So you, you can see that you start having a positive probability of having a, another cation behind you. This is the direction of the electric field. And this actually, this means that the ions, when they, they're conducted, they tend to form, they want to form strings, okay? So you have a positive ion which is moving along here, and you're quite likely to find one ahead here and one ahead. So, so you actually pick this very simple theory, picks up a, a tendency of these driven particle systems to sort of form strings, okay? And then you have, here you have the equivalent uh, diagram for the um, plus and minuses. Okay, so, so let me see, we need five minutes. Okay, so, and you can, so, so there are lots of things, and you can actually look at this for other interacting particle systems, okay? So, um, and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back and talk about self-diffusion constants. So let's forget a minute about salt. Imagine we're looking at the same sort of problem that Jorge was looking at. We have particles which are interacting, and we want to know what the effective diffusion constant is. So Jorge was looking at these plateaus, and this late-time diffusion constant, if, it, if this plateau goes on forever, this late-time diffusion constant is zero, and the system is jammed. It can't evolve at very late times, okay? So... The first time I started looking at this problem, I, when I was doing my thesis, I looked at diffusion in random media, and then one day I thought, you know, so it's the same philosophy. You look at random systems, and then you want to look at particle systems. So we develop, developed a certain technology to look at diffusion in random media. Now, if I just think about an interacting particle system, I can write down a Fokker-Planck equation, and the potential for this, with a very large dimensional space, the potential for this Fokker-Planck equation is just the pairwise interaction potential. And the idea is that we would do some sort of weak disorder perturbation theory. Look at the effect of, so I mean, it's not going to give you non-perturbative effects like mode coupling theory, but it, the results, you, at least you can believe them in the, term, in, in the sense that you know, you're doing some sort of systematic expansion. So there's no, no ad hoc side to it here. So the idea was to do one loop perturbation theory. And I was quite young, and my student was quite young. And we thought this was a good idea. 
until we started working out the diagrammatic perturbation theory. So the idea is in your Feynman diagrams, if you have a one-loop diagram, you only have one momentum uh, flowing through it. So, and you can actually do this for this interacting particle system. I mean, this is not the sort of thing that I would want to do now, okay? But so you have all these diagrams. There are an infinite number of one-loop diagrams that you have to sum up, um, and they have to be summed up from each diagram has a certain number of particles in it, okay? So they go up from, you know, you, you have a certain number of particles. So these are the diagrams you have to sum. So this just has one set of momentum running through it. And um, eventually we computed a diffusion constant for this. So we calculated the, the corrections to the diffusion constant. And I actually think that it never in my life have I been so sure that a paper has been wrong. Because the number of times we redid the calculations, we went backwards and forwards and we were summing these diagrams. But in the end, in the numerical simulations and for soft systems, it seemed to work quite well. And so now, this comes to the point. So my student, Vincent Demery, a student I later had, came along and he took the, de the stochastic density with, with Olivier Benichou and Hugo Jacquin, who was a student of Fred's. And they basically, they had the idea, well, actually, just look at a tracer particle and let's look at the other particles, they're diffusing around it. So they basically, if you look at the total density field, um, you can write down a, a theory for the fluctuations of the density without the tracer particle. And so basically all the other particles, they're basically generating a potential which is felt by one, one tracer particle. So then they said, okay, so, so we look at this theory here. We look at the dynamical equation for the tracer particle. So this is just interacting with the other, all the other particles. So you know, the, it's just a convolution of the gradient of the, the potential, and it has a noise. And they, they wrote a paper. Now, our paper was, was 15 pages long, and Frederick van Vigelen has been sort of provoking me for years and years about this and saying, you know, some of your powers have grown weak, old man. Uh, the young Jedi has shown you how to do the calculation. So, um, and he, d he did this for a long time, so this is why I'm talking about this. So they got this same calculation. So, it's exactly, so I, was, I was very happy because this horrible combinatorial calculation we did was right. At least, yeah, so, so, so it, it seems to suggest it was right. So this is the tracer formula. But actually now, let's do it purely from stochastic differential theory, the SDFT, without any path integrals, okay? So, so basically converting it into a problem of one particle in a fluctuating potential. How can you do it directly from the SDFT? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at two different, it's an identical particle system, right? But I'm just going to decide to call some of the particles white particles and some of the particles black particles, right? So the black particles, I'm going to apply a force to. That's the only difference. Of course, that doesn't happen in real life, okay? Right? So we have the bulk then. So they both have a bulk density. And what the idea is that I'm going to take the limit where the black particles, there are very few of them, okay? So now, if I take this, I write down the two species stochastic density functional theory. So you can see that the... <coughs> These basically, each of these particles, the white particles have their own noise, um, but they talk to each other because obviously the white particles and the black particles, they interact with each other, they don't see the difference, okay? And you have this noise, okay? But the idea now is that if I look at the average current of the black particles, I can write down the same thing. So you basically find if I expand everything in terms of the fluctuations, the crucial term is this reaction force between the particles is given by this term here. You show this term here doesn't contribute. So if I have small f, a small force, then I know that the current is basically rho 2, the density of my particles of type 2, times them and their effective mobility times the force, right? Then I can use Stokes-Einstein and say this mobility for these particles of type 2 is just beta times the effective diffusion constant. So now actually you solve the same theory as I did for the Onsager case. You find that the correlation function has two parts. It has one part, which is an equilibrium term, what you get when you set f equals to zero, and you find this contribution here, which is, so you're taking, you're interested in the limit where rho two is going to zero, and rho one is going to the bulk density, okay? So you take all of your particles eventually to be the bulk, okay? So this is the first order perturbation theory, and so if you put this in, you find this result. So you can get the result even in an even simpler way, okay? So, but actually, so, okay, so, so the thing is, that, so the, the, the interesting thing about this, this linearized SD, SDFT is that you can get lots of interesting results uh, easier. So it means if you work a bit harder with it, you could you, you can go further. So this is the, this is, this is the, um, this is the point that I'll, I'll stop on and ask you if you've got any questions, okay? <coughs>